Happy to be joined by Jeff Quartermain, CEO of Perseus Mining, all the way from Sydney. Uh, welcome, uh, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Excellent. We're very happy that you, you were able to participate in this event. Uh, Perseus is uh, quite an interesting company, providing uh, managed exposure to precious metals in the geographically rich jurisdiction of West Africa. And so we, uh, you're the first West African uh, participant we've had today in terms of focus area. So why don't you start? Why don't we start off by you giving us a little bit of an overview of uh, Perseus Mining and what you're doing in in, in West Africa and and uh, how is that going? Yeah, certainly. Look, uh, well, Perseus is an Australian domicile uh, company, as you know, and and it has all of its activities operations. Uh, uh, located in West Africa, as you say. So we have three operating mines. We have Yayori and Susingi in uh, Cote d'Ivoire or the Ivory Coast. And we have a third mine, Edican, that's located in the neighbouring uh, country of Ghana. And so we're a multi-mine, uh, multi-jurisdiction company. Um, in the 12 months to 30 June, which is the end of our financial year, we produced around 330,000 ounces of gold at around $1,000 an ounce. Now our target over the next 12 months is to be producing at a rate of 500,000 ounces per year. And I am very pleased to say that we're, we are actually producing at that level at the current time. Um, mm. in, in that financial year, we generated something like 140 million Australian dollars of profit after tax and cash flow from operations it was around Australian $300 million. And, and that enabled us to declare a, a maiden dividend uh, this year of one and a half cents um, from uh, following the release of our results. So we're now starting to put ourselves in a position where we can return capital uh, to our shareholders. Um, the market capitalization, it, it's about 1.4 billion US dollars. We've had a bit of a hit in the last couple of days, I might add, but uh, around 1.4 billion US dollars. Um, mm. And our net cash position is well over 100 million US dollars and, and counting. So um, look, we've grown significantly in recent years and, and we expect that growth to continue. Uh, we have a very well-funded exploration program underway at each of our three operations and we uh, we're highly confident that we'll be adding incrementally to our reserve base to enable that 500,000 ounce level of production to be maintained uh, out to uh, towards the end of the decade now um, you know clearly the results that are coming from the exploration program are encouraging and you know without any further acquisitions or anything of that nature um, the future for Persis is looking very strong indeed excellent very good uh was very impressed with your response uh, to the pandemic. I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, how that played out, and you know, of course, with the new variant out, uh, that originated in South Africa. Uh, uh, just wanted your 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 view and your you know, um, just some insights from you on how on how your response was to the pandemic and how you see things going forward. Sure. No. Well, look, it's an interesting situation. This one. I mean, we being located. In Australia, close to Asia, I, I guess we became very conscious of the threat of COVID fairly early on in the piece relative to, say, some of the other countries in the world. And also the fact that we had operated throughout the uh, Ebola crisis in West Africa in 2016. And what that alerted us to the fact was that, you know, when these pandemics came along, one, one didn't delay um, in responding. I mean, our, our reaction to crises has always been one of you know better to escalate early and and then phase back rather than the other way mm -hmm. around so mm -hmm. this this led us to put in place some pretty strict controls at, at each of the sites very early mm -hmm. and uh, i have to say it was pretty successful during 2020 we had zero literally zero cases at, at our two operating mines and only three cases on the construction site which was mm -hmm. a little harder to pin down as we had you know 1500 people a day coming and going now, this year we have de-escalated our measures a little and we've experienced a few cases, but there's been no disruption at all to the business. Mm -hmm. um, I think things are reasonably under control. We are starting to experience delays in shipping and some cost pressures mm -hmm. resulting from the COVID crisis, but you know, mm -hmm. provided we can maintain spares and consumables on site, we're in pretty good shape. In, yeah. in terms of the community um, around us though, look, 96% of our employees in West Africa and our local people. And so mm -hmm. there's an inextricable link between our workforce and our community. So mm -hmm. it was very much in our interest to work closely with our host community. So we were very active in supplying uh, medical equipment and uh, consumables and disinfecting mm -hmm. high traffic areas, et cetera, et cetera. So 
um, running education programs and the like. So we work very closely with the communities and, uh, you know, I think it, uh, it stood us in reasonably good stead. But having said that, I, I don't think we're, um, you know, while we are managing it quite well, I don't think we're anywhere near finished. There's uh, quite some distance to run on this before it's uh, it's all done and dealt, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And that's why at the start I mentioned well-managed exposure because, you know, the old adage in mining is, uh, you know, you look at the, 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 the geological uh, benefits and values, and then you look at management because uh, the guys who are able to uh, to operate in, in in particular certain regions, it's uh, it's a key consideration in that investment decision. So, uh, mm -hmm. I think your team certainly has had a long a long history and success in that region. And so, uh, since uh, you were established in 2000, 2004, I believe. I wanted, right. you know, you touched on the, the environment and stakeholders, local stakeholders, and, and some of the things that you've been doing there. Uh, I talked earlier with uh, with a few, um, with with uh, before you, I spoke with Newcrest, and and uh, they also have quite a, a strong history of of operating um, successfully in their in their environments. How are you seeing the ESG, the whole ESG cycle? You know, you've been around, as I said, from 2004. You, you've witnessed really a full growth cycle of ESG when it comes to reporting and, and documentation. How has that journey been for you? Yeah, look, it's an interesting it's an interesting subject. I mean, the whole matter of ESG is relatively new it's concept to a lot of people, but not to us, I might say. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's been a fundamental part of our DNA right from the beginning. I mean, right. we recognise that we are guests in other people's countries and communities, and so <laughs> it's absolutely vital for us to maintain that social licence to operate and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and make sure that all of our activities and actions are at the highest possible level, be it environmental, health and safety, community and government relations, and, of course, corporate governance. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess what is new in this, in this space is that in recent times there's been a series of global standards established, you know, World Gold Council, Responsible Gold Mining Principles, et cetera, that, that right. sort of thing. And, and, and our mission is really to ensure that, that we um, not only comply with those standards, which is, you know, something that I think we, we, we certainly do at each of our operating sites and exploration sites, but also the task for us is to make sure that other stakeholders are actually aware of what, what we've been doing. We, what we haven't done well in the past is publicise um, our achievements. But in the last couple of years, we've we've been producing very very comprehensive sustainability reports, setting out precisely what it is that we're doing, where we're, what our roadmap is going forward, and um, and I think they've been quite well received by our uh, certainly by our investors and and others who uh, who opine on these sorts of matters. Yes, yes, the disclosure and reporting has certainly become a critical part of that whole process now. So. Uh, mm -hmm. It's great. We we have actually been uh, doing what, our part to help out as many of our issuers as possible with providing uh, tools to help uh, in in reporting uh, and disclosing their ESG practices. One one particular tool I'm very happy about is the IHS uh, Market ESG Repository that we have, and what it is really is a tool to standardize ESG reporting, regardless of whichever standard you're you're using, SASB or whatever. You can input your ESG uh, record into this repository, and and investors are able to access it and and compare against other uh, potential invest investments. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know reporting is critical going forward. Uh, changing gear a little bit here. Uh, what is your opinion on the on the precious metals? We all know, you know, we've been feeling uh, inflationary uh, pressures. I certainly have, and I think everybody has. Really, some say it's temporary, and, and as a result of uh, uh, the pandemic, as you alluded to earlier, in terms of increased pricing uh, due to to the the, 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 the value chain and in the supply chain. Sorry, because of the pandemic. But one of your your I couldn't let you leave here without asking your you what you think about uh, gold price and where it's going and what 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 can we look forward to in 2022? Well, look, you know, I, I guess I'm I'm definitely no expert in these things. I, I'm, a, I'm a price taker rather than a price maker per se. Mm. And and you know, having said that, of course, it does seem fairly apparent to me that our global financial system is under pretty severe pressure and, and yeah. you know, traditionally at least that's meant that as an asset class, uh, gold has performed fairly well. 
I mean, call me old fashioned, but I, I, I do believe that history repeats itself. And, mm -hmm. and on that basis, I, I describe myself as a, a mild gold bull. I, I, I do think that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we are going to enjoy a strong gold price for a little, uh, a little bit longer than, uh, you know, before mm -hmm. we, we see downward, downward trend or permanent downward trend. Yeah. Uh, another uh, uh, trend that's been that's been building quite a bit here in uh, in, in the sector in the mining sector space is M and A activity. We see uh, earlier this year, of course, uh, the battery metal space, lithium in particular, was enjoying quite a bit of uh, activities in the M and A when it come, came to M and A. But recently, we saw quite a few uh, precious metal deals enter into force. So. Um, Wanted you to talk a little bit about that. What do you see happening in the space, and from from an M and A perspective, do you see more deals like uh, the Newcrest, uh, 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 Pritium, Kirkland Lake, Agnico Eagle? There's so many. It's 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 amazing. Yeah, and no, I look. There has been a fair bit of activity. It is it is interesting. I mean, um, one doesn't have to think too far back and. Uh, and recall that investors were, you know, berating mining companies, telling them that size was not important, that what was needed was a focus on cash flow generation. And we certainly took that lesson on board and have focused on cash for some time. But look, there definitely is a place for M&A. There's no doubt about it. I mean, as a mining company, what we do need to do is to replenish our oil reserves as they're consumed mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. you know, uh, provided the the industrial logic and, and economics uh, of business combinations are compelling, I can see no reason why uh, it shouldn't uh, shouldn't continue because you know if you find if you look at a company like Perseus for instance um, you know we're we're capable uh, right through the value chain per se but um, we we do have an expertise in developing projects as we've demonstrated in recent times and we're now financially very strong so by combining with uh, junior companies who have made exploration who may not have the technical capability of actually delivering the project or funding it then you know to me that seems like a sensible kind of uh, kind of combination and and we're constantly on the lookout for for inorganic growth opportunities and in the last couple of years we we have actually made a couple of acquisitions we acquired uh, amara mining plc a british company in mm -hmm. 2016 and that delivered to us the aori gold mine which now having brought it online you know represents 60 percent of our production and similarly mm -hmm. last year we, we made another small acquisition of a of, an, of a small exploration company with land adjacent to our Sasingi operation. And we're very confident that the combination of those two things will see that mine operating for, for quite a number of years to come. So I guess from our perspective, we're very capable of executing m and uh, when the opportunity presents. Right. Uh, we won't be getting swept up in, you know, in the fever of M&A and, you know, being driven by the investment bankers and the service providers. But as I say, where we can see real value for our shareholders, we, we certainly wouldn't hesitate to pull the trigger. Interesting. Uh, I spoke to a, a, another mining executive recently who mentioned to me that uh, one one theory he has is that you'll see more mining companies diversifying outside of a particular uh, commodity, you know, rather than being, say, a precious metals company. Uh, you'll find in the future there'll be more companies of the type of, uh, you know, diversified companies like Rio Tinto, BHPs of the world. Do you agree with this? Uh, maybe I'm not sure. I mean, look, put it this way: I've certainly had conversations with investors in the past who have said to us, "Look, you leave the diversification across metals to us. We'll we'll pick and choose what exposures we want. You focus on gold." So I right. know that is also a contrary position, but he may be right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's a theory. Uh, you are listed on a TSX and ASX, and I just uh, wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that dual listing strategy and in uh you know in as far well as far as perseus is concerned how is that playing out for you yeah look it's interesting i mean we listed in toronto i think it was 210 or 211 so quite a long time ago and and the investment world has obviously changed quite a lot since then i mean when we were starting out uh, cross-border investment was not as common as it is today mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and we did need to need multiple listings in order to access capital in mm -hmm. the different jurisdictions now um, you know, but when we were small, uh, we were very successful in raising equity in uh, on the TSX, um, and we are listed in Toronto, as you say, and Australia um, mm -hmm. today. But I, I guess it's not unsurprising what we have seen over that ten-year period, though, is that uh, investors tend to drift to wherever the liquidity is best, mm -hmm. and in, in our case, uh, that's Australia. So we're certainly more 
liquid here than than we are in North America. But look, the having the uh, listing in Toronto does have its advantages, though, because we actually have forty percent of our shareholding, or a little over forty percent, is is located in the United States, for instance, mm -hmm. and many of those investors feel comfortable knowing that if there is a need, they can trade in their own mm -hmm. time zone rather than having to wait, uh, you know, for Australia to open. So it is advantageous there. And I'm also hopeful too that in the future in terms of M&A, um, you know, being able to transact with Canadian companies will be so much easier having the the yeah. TSX listing. So look, I think um, there are pros and cons for, for, for multiple listings. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, our circumstances have certainly changed over the year. We're not in a position where we're seeking to raise new equity. So it's a little different to where we were 10 or 11 yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. No, you're so right. And and my conversation earlier with Sandy Biswap from uh, from uh, Newcrest Mining is very consistent with what you said there. And, and many of the reasons why they, they added a Toronto list in last October is for the same reasons you just pointed out. So definitely it's not for everyone, but certainly it's for some. Uh, wanted to give you the last words here, Jeff. Uh, what can you leave investors with in terms of, you know, let's say, three points you want investors to consider when they think about Perseus Mining? Well, look, Perseus is a is a very attractive investment opportunity, and I think it does warrant very careful consideration. The, the reasons are these: that I guess we deliver, we strive to deliver consistent and reliable operating and financial performance, and that's underpinned by transparent professional management. And I think the evidence over the last you know, five or so years is fairly clear to be seen that, that that is exactly what we're delivering and we're very reliable. Now, while we are a West African focused uh, uh, enterprise, what we provide investors is a, is a, a lower risk profile than some of our, our peers insofar mm -hmm. as we are geographically diversified and or, you know, from a technical point of view, we're, we're diversified by having different operations. So we do have a good spread of risk. And I think that is attractive to many investors who aren't necessarily that familiar with Africa as a place to do business. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I think in, investors in Perth, Perseus have the opportunity to achieve uh, very material growth in terms of their investment, not only in terms of capital gain, but also through, I mentioned earlier, that we've commenced uh, you know, paying dividends to our shareholders, recurrent income, either mm -hmm. in the form of dividends or, or through capital returns. So I think that you know, all of those things are important to investors, be they small investors or larger investors, mm -hmm. and um, all of which I think recommend Perseus as a stock to be taken seriously. Excellent. Excellent point to end on. Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. I do appreciate your time as well. Thank you.